Great. It looks like we have about 20 people in our breakout room right now. Let's just give it another maybe minute or so. But in the meantime, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat, I'll, uh, you know, we'd love to know a little bit more about who's here. Um, we've also asked you if you're willing to share. Uh, we'd love to know what some of your favorite summertime activities on the island are for those who have a chance to enjoy the beautiful summer. Did we just speak up? Sure, you're welcome to, or uh, if you prefer to use the chat box, you're also welcome to do that. I, I, I'm Judy Rushmore and I live in Brant Point. And on the island in the summertime, I love to bicycle and garden. That sounds great. Anybody else would like to share? Be definitely welcome. Uh, your thoughts about summer time, all things summer. Uh, I'm Neil Foley. I'm the education coordinator and ecologist for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Uh, some of my favorite things to do during summer, go birding, go outside, take a hike, um, walk along, do whatever it is outside while the getting's good. Yeah, well, hello to everybody. This is Lee Saperstein. I've just told the chat that uh, I'm secretary to the town association. And uh, what I didn't put in the chat is that we're trying to establish a local area plan for the Nantucket town. It's basically the commercial downtown, uh, sorry, the residential old historic incorporating commercial uh, downtown and the waterfront. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Maybe I'll also ask, um, we have uh, uh, a co-facilitator in our group as well. Kim, are you available to say hi and maybe introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Kim Rose and I am the Preservation Associate of the Craig Group. And my name is Chelsea Kilburn. I'm here from the Stoss team. So I'm coming from Stoss Landscape Urbanism in Boston. Um, I'm the project manager on um, our side of the, the project and I've really enjoyed working with Kim and the team so far. So really looking forward to hearing your thoughts um, and getting some feedback because I think we're at a really critical point in the project um, now. And we wanna know what feels like some of the right ways to move forward for you. Um, again, I'd like to just reiterate that uh, some of the things that Trevor had mentioned, um, uh, you know, we're presenting a number of strategies in this breakout group. This is, this is meant to be a workshop, very interactive. So please feel free to use the chat box and also to, if you have a question, feel free to, to either raise your hand if you're comfortable with that, or, um, you know, we can even jump in if we're a small enough group to have a conversation. Um, I'd like to remind you that these are, Again, <laughs> recommendations that are in development, they're not final. Um, so please um, take that into consideration as we work through um, this workshop. But let's go ahead and dive into our group. So um, this is group two. Uh, you have selected a group that will be discussing Nantucket Harbor. We're including Pulpus Harbor at Group Two and Great Point here as well. And then like Trevor mentioned, we're also all discussing downtown. So everybody who's part of this uh, session will be discussing um, downtown because it is a critical piece of infrastructure to the island as a whole. Uh, as a <laughs> another point, I do wanna remind everybody that this session is being recorded. So um, it'll be part of, uh, it'll be made available to the town in the coming days. And please remind, um, Please keep in mind that if you do not want to be recorded, you're welcome to turn off your camera, but we encourage you to do so, to keep it on if you feel comfortable. Um, a few quick guidelines that we also like to use when we're kicking off these different workshops. Um, we ask you that you acknowledge everyone's voice and time. If you do find yourself, yourself speaking frequently, we consider 
um, a way to open up the floor to others. We know that a lot of folks here have uh, expertise and have a lot of information to share. So we definitely welcome that. We just ask that we um, you know, are able to carry a conversation forward as a group. Um, we also ask that you speak from your own experience. We really want to know what Nantucket means to you personally, and again, um, understand sort of the, the finer grain detail of life on Nantucket. Um, if there are several group members, as there are in this group, uh, I would suggest using the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, that might be an easier way for us to carry forward the conversation. And then, as I mentioned, if you're willing and able to, um, we'd ask that you consider turning on your camera. And then because we're using Zoom, if there is an event where um, you would like to leave the room, uh, you're able to click on return to main session in your um, toolbar in Zoom. And if you'd like to leave the meeting entirely, please select leave meeting. Otherwise, you may be removed from <laughs> uh, um, more than just the breakout room and from the meeting entirely. So um, just keep that in mind as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this group is discussing Nantucket Harbor. Um, here I'd like to introduce an additive approach to Nantucket Harbor. So this is a protect strategy which recommends a spectrum of structural and natural approaches to slow erosion and protect assets. This strategy recognizes the critical importance of Nantucket Harbor and CO2 and recommends an additive and adaptive strategy to respond to sea level rise as effects become more severe over time. So we'll um, return to this image and talk a little bit more in detail about how some of these strategies might be played out in um, the specific subgeography. But keep in mind that we're looking at a spectrum of different approaches here at the harbor. Uh, so we begin by looking at a number of key resilience issues that the team has identified so far in this specific subgeography. Um, we can begin by looking at items. Um, such as the potential breach of barrier beaches. We can see this here at CO2. The orange is um, demonstrating a 1% flood event. So this would be um, a, a, a large coastal storm, a 1% chance storm. Uh, we can see that this orange color is uh, um, dominating <laughs> a large portion of the map that we're looking at here. Um, this is obviously linked to a number of items um, that regard habitat, so the potential loss of eelgrass habitat in the harbor. We understand that this is not only an essential place for um, different species and habitat to thrive, but it's also very tied to the character of Nantucket and to the livelihood of those who live in Nantucket. Um, as I mentioned on this end, there's also a potential breach, and we understand that this has historically also been a place of breach um, uh, uh, when there is an extreme event. And then of course, we are also concerned with damage or disruption of different um, structures, private residences, both due to flooding, again in the orange, and then also due to erosion, which you can see outlined here in a dashed red line. The other thing that we're considering, as Trevor mentioned in the main sort of discussion, is we're looking at loss of roadways and critical access. So we understand that there are several sort of main arteries throughout the island, one of them being Pulpus Road. Um, and knowing that there's an issue already of flooding um, around Sacagawea Pond, um, again, we can see the, the orange continuing through the slower part of the map here. And so uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was start to talk about um, resilience frameworks and Maybe we can think about this as different zones of intervention. Again, these are the beginning points of recommendations, and these are not necessarily uh, you know, final, but we'd like to understand where um, we can sort of expand the conversation and start to think about how these things feel right or might be something that we move um, forward or away from. So again, keeping in mind the different um, resilience issues that we just looked at, uh, there are a number of sort of zones or overlays that we can begin to consider. So understanding at the top here, resilient transportation corridors. If we're thinking about main places of access that need to be enhanced or preserved um, for the sake of emergency access or just you know, getting across the island, um, you can see this, this purple color is translated again into the zone uh, on the map here. So we're showing sort of a, a strip along the edge where we do experience flooding. 
And again, as I mentioned, um, near Sackage of Hans, uh, there is another intervention that is proposed um, here. The second zone of uh, sort of preliminary recommendation would be this yellow color, nature-based erosion management. And so there are many different ways in which we could um, approach erosion management. As we saw on the last slide, those lines, those lines of erosion, and I'm gonna flip back quickly, are one of the issues at play um, in regards to risk at this time. So in thinking about how to manage erosion, this is obviously a critical zone. And um, we could begin to think about what types of strategies. Oh, I'm sorry, somebody asked, could you scroll down? Uh, this is actually the extent of our screen. So uh, if there's an issue seeing something, um, we might be able to zoom in and out a little bit, but this is actually the extent of our screen right now. Um, uh, so let me return to erosion management, um, thinking about potential uh, nature-based solutions that could include um, uh, non-structural adaptations. Uh, that could be uh, uh, implementations that are uh, akin to things that we might see elsewhere on the island. Um, we could use uh, instances that are like planting or sand fencing, but also thinking about how there might be the need for structural implementation at areas closer to the entry of the harbor, given that this is an essential corridor for access in and out of the island itself. So that's represented here in the orange color. We also have the need uh, to consider, again, um, uh, habitat protection and looking at items like marsh migration. So understanding what pieces of Nantucket we are able to um, enhance and celebrate. Uh, the natural beauty and character of Nantucket is something that we've heard quite a bit about and again, really want to celebrate. Um, so thinking about all of the area within the harbor that offers these resources, um, allowing them space potentially to migrate uh, both horizontally and vertically and to think about how installations might um, be paired with uh, protection of these resources. Um, of course, there's also the question of how we adapt um, access to the water. So thinking about points where we would need to do that, that could include raising structures or again, thinking about access to different um, water access points, uh, access via roadways. Um, and then as I mentioned, um, thinking about what installations like breakwaters or corns might mean uh, if there's a more structural implementation uh, nearer to the, the um, mouth of the harbor itself. So as I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, this is sort of a framework to think about how we might have a spectrum of installations, uh, thinking about how there might be a, a more structural implementation um, at one end of uh, CO2 and how that might be paired and complemented by something that is more nature-based um, to allow for these uh, different forms of adaptation and protection uh, to, to work in this area. Um, I'm unfortunately not able to see so much of the chat right now. I'm wondering if, Kim, you're able to capture any critical questions. Yeah, so we actually, up. We actually just had a question come in from Joanna. She asked, can you talk about the timeline for the potential erosion to CO2? At the Envision Resilience presentation, the focus was on the sea level rise in the harbor over the next 10 years. What impact would that have on the sea level rise? Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, thank you, Joanna, for the question. So I'm gonna actually take us back to this map quickly and we do have an additional map we can look at together too. But you can see here that we have um, shown erosion lines for 2050 and both for 2070. We're using those two timelines as sort of the, the near-ish <laughs> near future and something that we feel is um, uh, a workable horizon. Uh, the data that we have is, is projective. And so um, uh, it is also, um, uh, the question I suppose that you have is how is this paired with um, the sea level rise data? And from my understanding is these two have been developed in tandem, I believe. Um, so it's a question of 
um, knowing what we what we might be able to propose uh, uh, to help slow erosion on this side that could in turn uh, reduce the effects of flooding um, in this area. Um, I, I just saw a hand go up. Joanna, was that you? Yes, it's me. So I went to the uh, Envision Resilience presentation and what they were talking about was a four to nine inch sea level rise over the next 10 years. So 2050 seems far away when we are talking mm -hmm. about this. Uh, and some of, and so the question that I had really was, does the potential erosion to CO2 impact that sea level rise either to the positive or to the negative? Right, because I didn't fully understand that part. I see. Yeah, um, that is a great question. Um, it's something that we've been uh, um, thinking about how these two are paired, right? So the, the obvious risk is the question of if this erodes, um, what happens to the inner harbor and sea level rise on, on this side of CO2. Um, and so that's why part of our um, implementation strategy, and I'm just going to bounce back to the other frame. I apologize for bouncing around, but let me just do this quickly. Um, the implementation strategy would be on the outside of CO2 uh, to perhaps uh, reduce the effects of erosion here. So in the, in the chance that erosion does wear down this area and potentially breach um, CO2, uh, the goal would be to have a strategy in place that could um, uh, prevent um, uh, impacts on the inner side of the harbor. And this is, a, of course, like a, a large scale framework. So um, we're talking, you know, um, about like a, a large scale implementation strategy um, and not, have not yet uh, arrived at specific locations along this, this stretch. So Joanna has her hand raised again, if you would like to unmute. Yeah. So, so then help me understand the timeline a little better. So if we are looking, if we are talking about a four to nine inch sea level rise, you know, on Washington Street or in the harbor or any of that area, I guess part of what I'm trying to get at is does protecting CO2 mitigate that sea level rise? And is it like a first barrier of defense, right? In terms of how that water would impact mm -hmm. the town? Because obviously in terms of planning, that would be an important thing to understand. Yes, yeah, you're correct. And um, I'm not sure that I am the best person to answer that question. I would love to invite you to stay to our, um, uh, we're gonna have a time where we come back together as a group. Um, that'll be in about an hour or, 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm sure Trevor would be happy to answer that question. Um, it is something that I think is a very, um, uh, there's obviously a lot of factors that are all interwoven in this, this area, especially um, near the harbor. Um, so I'd, I'd love to invite you to, to, to ask the question there as well. Um, but in this strategy, we would be um, proposing um, again, a spectrum of different implementation strategies that could um, uh, lessen the effects of uh, erosion to CO2 and potentially that um, those breakthrough points. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I believe um, C. Sutton also raised their hand if you would like to unmute. Hi, yeah, so I had, um... Yes, I'm not quite sure how all this works, but um, so while I understand what you were just saying about the, I think she said, Joanne said four to nine inch, and maybe the conversation is supposed to happen now. I'm not sure. Um, seawater rise, <clears throat> that's going to affect the harbor regardless of the hard structures on the outside. Um, as you know, the tides come in, they rise and they, they lower. Um, but I think the hard structure is meant for uh, storm surges and things like that. So part of my concern with the hard breakwater um, that I think we saw with the repairs to the breakwater uh, 
in the jetties area is that <clears throat> the power of the wave still comes in, but it dissipates down the sides. And so I sometimes have concern about these hard water structures because they tend to move the damage to the end of wherever that structure ends. Like here it's on third point. Mm -hmm. um, then, and, and so what I was saying about the jetties piece is that they came at the engineers. Uh, no. What, what, what I was gonna, anyway, they, you now see more damage from the heavy nor'easter kind of a storm, which obviously we haven't had in a year or two, but um, mm -hmm. is, is now eroding the eel point uh, area, I think sort of at Kapam Road, which if you take that all the way around comes out on um, uh, North Swift Road, I believe, but we have more erosion happening there because the mm -hmm. breakwater was solidified. So now the power of the water, you know, can't go through. So I think we have to think about how we reduce the momentum or the energy within the wave versus trying to figure out how we can build a wall against the wave. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. No, thank you for your comment. I think one of the recommendations from the plan would be um, a sediment transport study to understand exactly where we are facing um, or where, where sediment is transferred and eroded from. Um, that is um, a very good point. I think that there are definitely trade-offs to understand um, when one area is more structurally protected. So. Um, Thank you for pointing that out. We can look at that uh, in the downtown section a little bit more as well, what, what some proposals are. Another question or point. Uh, um, in the eel grass situation, um, I know mm -hmm. we have a lot of harbor runoff and things, but one of the things I really noticed during the summer, um, you know, we're, we're not really prone to regulation out here and as the uh, summer residents have grown, the number of boats within the harbor has grown and the speed at which they go has grown. And it seems to me they, they're, you know, one may want to think about, and maybe not, but one may want to think about some form of regulation where at low tides, you're not running over the eel grass at like 40 miles an hour in your speedboat. Because I think that does a lot of damage to, you know, eel grass getting caught in propellers and things like that, ripping it out of the ground. I know we don't really look at that because we look at runoff, but the use of the harbor, um, power boats has increased substantially. And I think it's, it. I mean, I view it as having an impact and I'd be interested to see if other people see that as well. So thank you. Yes, thank you for all your points. That is definitely something that we've um, uh, had internal conversations about as well. Um, I think there are many points to this plan that will need to be paired with, um, uh, uh, regulatory and agency frameworks and strategies. Um, so thank you for, for putting that out on the table. I think that's, that's a, a great point. Um, so Chelsea, uh, Kate Shea had a question um, and she posted it in the comments, but she also raised her hand. So I'll ask her to unmute so that yes, she may so ask it. I, thank you. So actually my comment that I raised my hand for is actually to sort of pick up on something that I think it was Chelsea speaking, but it's hard to know in this format. It has to do with the necessity of a sediment transport study. I've attended many of these forums and also the one focused on Baxter Road. And what keeps coming up repeatedly is when we get down to the nitty gritty of, you know, what exactly will be the impact of different mm -hmm. potential measures? And will there be what benefit will there be and what adverse impact might there be and how beneficial will it be? We keep hearing that what's really needed is a sediment transport study. And then 
what we hear is that that's really not part of the scope of mm -hmm. the Arcadis um, planning process with the coastal resiliency planning process. And at the same time, we're hearing that um, Arcadis and the town are going to be coming up with proposed um, plans and recommendations regarding priorities based on input in the town, yet it seems as though this critical piece of information, which is the sediment transport study, keeps being pointed to but is not part of this. And I'm, I'm really concerned and wondering whether um, the number one recommendation is going to be that before any decisions are made that a sediment transport study needs to be done. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, as I as I mentioned, uh, um, that is definitely something that we've discussed as a team. And again, I, I think that's something that we can definitely um, uh, talk about as a larger group when we do return to our larger group. But um, it is a necessary, or it would be um, a necessary next step um, uh, that would inform a lot of different decisions. I think that's a great point. Thank you. Yes, I do hope that will really be stressed because it's been sort of referred to multiple times. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Kim, are there any other hands that are raised right now that we could ask um, to, to unmute or should we go to the next slide? Yes, Lee has had his hand raised and then we have oh, great. more questions in the chat after that. Great. Hello, uh, Lee Saperstein. Um, a sometime sailor with Nantucket Community Sailing. We have some really smart people in Nantucket because the question on sediment transport uh, captures my concern uh, entirely. If we look at the harbor, there are some vulnerable points uh, on KOTU and Head of Harbor and the Hallover. Should one of the recommendations yeah. be that we need to establish natural barriers more um, marshlands, more uh, uh, vegetated dunes and so forth. The question becomes, would those um, devices be swept away uh, or would they be augmented by uh, mm -hmm. prevailing sediment transport routes? So far, um, while they look vulnerable, the sands continue uh, to keep us protected but I really think that if we're going to talk about the harbor, we need to make sure uh, that it doesn't wash away. Now, mm -hmm. one quickie, uh, when they raised the jetties, the velocity of flow in the channel at tidal change increased by a knot or more, which meant mm -hmm. um, there's more scouring in the channel, there's more sand deposition outside the jetties as... Um, the waters go back and forth. But I, uh, my, my hat off to the question about sediment transport, because those are the natural mechanisms that protect the harbor. If we're going yeah. to augment them, if we're going to enhance them, we need to know what we're doing so we just don't pour sand down a rat hole. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lee, for that, that, that point. I think um, if I can maybe just uh, we can continue the discussion and address the questions that are still in the chat, but maybe to just frame um, a couple of the potential tools that we do see as part of those strategies that we looked at in a sort of top-down plan zone type of view, where we might see some of those things get applied and, and perhaps what those strategies begin to look like. So to your point about, um, uh, you know, sediment transport and understanding uh, uh, what, what types of strategies might enhance natural processes, um, we could begin to envision uh, things like enhancement and stabilization of dunes um, through a couple of strategies here. So we can see that, uh, you know, along code to uh, structural offshore erosion management structures like offshore breakwaters or groins, as we um, mentioned before, could be recommended um, to effectively reduce the risk of barrier island breach and slow erosion. Um, but there are many trade-offs associated with doing things like that, um, including cost um, and potential um, uh, 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 change to some natural processes. So um, 
uh, thank you for your, your comments. So our next question is from Will. Um, he asks, may you please tell us more about marsh migration habitat pr protection? Are there any proposals for the town or conservation commission to provide resources or fee waivers for property owners to plant within wetland resource areas? Uh, yeah, that's also a fantastic question. Um, at this point, um, uh, like I mentioned, we understand that there would need to be um, a lot of overlap between uh, larger scale regulatory frameworks and some of these um, specific implementation strategies. Um, so um, uh, in, the, in the context of this area, some of the different things that we would propose um, related to habitat protection um, would be the need to sort of at a, an individual parcel level, um, if you are in a space um, that would be experiencing that erosion and flooding, um, there's a potential to adapt your home to allow for those natural processes um, uh, or, or, or to have um, like an individual adaptation strategy um, there. So this is just a sort of projective idea of what that, that could look like. Um, again, thinking about where there might be space uh, using some of the state's um, most recent SLAM data to show marsh migration where that might take place and understanding how there might be a limit on development to allow for those natural processes to continue. Um, and then again, like understanding that some of these, these um, structural implementation strategies might be paired with um, uh, other concerns such as um, uh, reducing the impact or uh, creation of waves in the inner harbor via a structure offshore. Um, so you can see in the distance um, the potential for an offshore erosion management structure um, so that there is not increased um, damage to resources like eelgrass in the area. Okay, great. And then our last question, if you'll go back a slide. Yeah. Perfect. So the last little section, the orange for breakwaters, Lisa's asking, would those be coupled with beach nourishment? Um, let me actually, I have a little note here that I just wanted to return to um, about the, the groins in particular. So give me one moment. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, again, thinking about this as a spectrum of um, hard implementation along with more natural approaches. Um, so we're looking at um, uh, the potentials for both natural and structural implementations around the island and understanding that if there is beach nourishment in one place that there, there may be an opportunity to also nourish another area. So um, this is a potential space where there could be beach nourishment, um, but the, one of the trade-offs would be understanding how that obviously affects sediment um, at the mouth of the harbor. Um, there are also opportunities around the island where that might be um, another strategy to consider. And so again, it's thinking about how there might be um, trade-offs about um, implementing uh, nourishment strategies. But I think in this area, um, the orange is representative of, of breakwaters and groins primarily. And then uh, you can see that this would be sort of the <laughs> in the distance. Uh, uh, if you were looking over the harbor, that would be the sort of um, image that could be paired with that. And then here, this might also address some of our um, uh, different, uh, you know, trade-offs and strategies that will, that might likely accompany some of these different um, uh, solutions that we've talked about. So obviously none of these solutions are, are perfect and they are very much um, to understand what, um, what you all might be interested in or comfortable with, um, how we might understand how these open up doors um, down the road or, or potentially um, change the direction that we, we move forward with. Um, and so each of these would be um, uh, supported by a, large, a longer term, term adaptation pathway, as you can see here in the, the um, teal colored box, green colored box here on the lower uh, right hand corner. Um, 
so some of the, the things that we have just sort of touched on that might be uh, potential trade-offs for this, this strategy would be, again, that private property owners would need to implement protection for their homes um, on a, a sort of individual basis, um, but that critical access to the area would be maintained. We looked at that um, portion of Pulpis and um, by the harbor as well as by Takaja Pond. Um, here to the point, breakwaters and groins may impact natural processes, but prolong the protective capacity of barrier islands. Um, and while we think about that, nature-based approaches are less effective potentially than harder solutions, but they do have the potential to sort of pair and enhance ecological value. Um, uh, and then in terms of how those might lead us towards uh, longer term adaptation pathways, um, some of those goals might be expansion or har of hardened coastal protection north towards Great Point. So thinking about how there might be an initiation of um, uh, structural implementation closer to the mouth of the harbor. And that might be, again, something that is, is spectral and, and um, is initially hardened uh, where it's most critically needed right now. And it could be something that expands towards Great Point. Um, one of the other things could be removal of infrastructure and private residences from areas subject to flood and erosion. Um, again, this is sort of paired with the need to manage risk on, the, on a much longer term um, time scale. And then again, paired with uh, thinking about how we maintain access, adaptation of resilient transportation corridors, potentially to new higher um, elevations or to new locations. Um, thinking about how uh, we can maintain a quality of life and access for things like um, uh, uh, emergency access and, and emergency vehicles. Um, so maybe as a, I think I just got a notification that we'd be moving into um, the, the town part of the slide deck following this. I know that there's been a lot of questions about um, some other areas um, including Brant Point and the Steam Short Dwarf. So maybe I'll pause here and just ask if there are any of these key sort of trade-offs um, that are entirely unacceptable to the group, um, if there's anything that feels like it's just a total no-go, um, or if there is anything in terms of a long-term adaptation pathway that we're missing that we need to think more closely about. Um, I'll mention something that comes to mind. I'm not um, necessarily saying this is a a reason to to not go in this direction of um, the breakwaters and the snow fencing, but I I also serve on the Great Point Property Committee for the Trustees of Reservations, and we mm -hmm. met the other uh, day and spoke about snow fencing, and it was news to me that. Um, this, although this does help build up sand, it um, makes it harder for the shorebirds to access and use the beach, which mm -hmm. is one of the priorities of the wildlife refuge. And in fact, um, I guess any mitigation measures they um, pursue, they have to have it cleared with um, World Heritage. It, it, they mentioned a name I was unfamiliar with, but um, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that um, you know, some of these, you mentioned regulations needing to be um, negotiated. Uh, and I think, you know, if we're really changing habitat, I think we'd want to understand uh, that we're doing that, that that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. I think that there's um, a sort of co-beneficial um, strategy that we'd like to think of, right? So not only improving uh, access for, for humans and, and people on the island, but understanding what those trade-offs are for ecological um, uh, uh, well-being as well and how those might be things that we pair together. Um, so um, uh, considering where it might be absolutely um, strategic to start a structural implementation and to think about how that pairs with um, something that is more nature-based is definitely something we're thinking about. Is there anything else that uh, we can 
uh, reflect on in, in this slide, or if there's any other comments, I'd be happy to, to take them and make note. Um, I'd also be happy to flip back to the previous slides. Um, otherwise, we can move into talking through downtown. I have just one other comment, which is when you think about um, when you think about code two, I think you also have to think about the haulover, um, mm -hmm. which has breached in the past and was open for quite some time in, I think it was the beginning of the 20th century and also in the 19th century. And there was actually quite a bit of debate about whether or not it should be um, manually kept open. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have that sort of event and it could be open for some time, how does that change the erosion patterns that we're experiencing on the other side? Just mm -hmm. a question. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's um, so one of the earlier questions, understanding how uh, erosion is um, uh, affecting potential sea level rise in the harbor is definitely something that uh, I think we can address in the, the main group, um, but is something that we're thinking about in this strategy as well. Are there any other hands that are raised, uh, Kim, that you can see? Um, it looks like Kate has her hand up, but I don't know if that's new or if that was from before. Sorry, that was from before. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I already <laughs> took your comment Thank as a note on the, the last slide. Great. Yeah. Preservation of the beach, uh, uh, natural state of beaches needs to be prioritized. Yes, thank you for that comment. Um, it looks like I just received a notification. Lee has his hand raised, Lee. Um, hi, I just unmuted my microphone. Just a quick point with respect to access to the water. From <laughs> Monomoy to the Hallover, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. there is only one public way that goes to the harbor, and that's Cathcart Road. Uh, mm -hmm. It's surrounded by um, private land on one side and land bank land on the other. There are other public ways to the water, but they are not publicly owned. For example, the um, University of Massachusetts Field Station allows people to get to the harbor. Uh, there are several walking paths that go to the harbor, but only Cathcart Road is publicly owned. Something to think about when uh, you consider um, access points and um, whether or not we need a, a, a few more. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, thank you for that. I think in this situation, um, there is one that we're showing here in that red point at Saka Japan, but I um, could understand the need to, to look at that um, around Polpos more closely as well. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for that. We can add a note for that as well. Um, uh, on this slide. So maybe for the, the sake of continuing the conversation and making sure we can um, uh, use our time moving forward, I'm gonna take us into downtown um, where we do have a little bit of a, a different strategy. So here, um, we'd like to propose this idea of um, defending downtown. So here, um, the idea is to preserve and enhance quality of life in downtown. Um, so this protect approach recommends a series of structural approaches that offer flood protection to the neighborhood core and its essential facilities. Um, erosion management in Brant Point and Monomoy reduces risk while maintaining water views and access. So again, this is um, a sort of uh, discussion to be had to understand um, what you all, um, you know, might be agreeable to um, and understanding what the different sort of trade-offs that we're considering um, might mean for, for um, different parts of, of downtown. So some of the key uh, resilience issues that we are focusing on uh, here, again, we can see as you're familiar now, the orange layer representing 
um, a 2070, so um, you know, still quite a, a 50 years in the future. This 1% uh, flood extent um, uh, paired with the erosion line again, you can see on the edge. Um, some of the different resilience issues here would be again damage or disruption of private residences from flooding and flooding that we're anticipating will increase over time. Uh, damage and disruption to businesses and different community assets from flooding, especially in the more sort of downtown core. So we think about things like Town Hall, the Whaling Museum, the Stop and Shop, <laughs> um, and then critical infrastructure like the Steamship Authority, the Steamboat Wharf, um, as well as things like the electrical substation. Um, and then, of course, there's also the potential for loss of roadways and critical access, um, including access along Easy Street and Washington Street. Um, streets that lead to the Steamboat Wharf, um, uh, which is potentially the highest risk essential facility on the island. Um, as we just looked at Echo 2, there's the potential for breach of barrier beaches and the loss of eelgrass uh, within the harbor. Um, if there are other resilience issues that you think we're missing here, um, we'd love to talk about it, um, but I'd ask that maybe we just look at the next slide and incorporate that in our discussion together. Um, so again, you know, thinking about these as uh, larger frameworks and zones, um, preliminary ideas here, uh, you can see that we're suggesting um, different approaches based on different issues. So within each of these sort of shaded zones, there could be a, a multitude of ways to approach this, but again, um, using this sort of purple color uh, to think about how we maintain access to this area, which um, we're considering a, a primary part of this preliminary strategy um, to do this. There are, again, several ways, but suggesting that we could elevate a number of major roads um, in the downtown area, including um, Hulbert Avenue, Easton Street, and Washington Street. Um, and by elevating these roadways, uh, we would have to, um, we, well, we could maintain things like emergency access, um, the roadways would be elevated high enough to offer flood protection against mean monthly high tide in 2070, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and that could also protect against the more frequent flood events prior to 2070. So using that as one of our sort of um, uh, timelines that we're reflecting on. Um, and this elevation we've, we've chosen because uh, it provides protection not only for the longer sort of uh, term, but also um, uh, could be something that uh, does not significantly impact um, as many of the historic buildings and resources that we have um, in this downtown core. So uh, we can take a look at what that might mean if we start to consider what a structural approach like raising a road or providing a flood wall might mean. Um, but that's one of the approaches that we're considering. Um, one of the other things that we would be thinking about is um, uh, at Brant Point uh, and the sort of yellow zone here, um, thinking about nature-based erosion management again. So thinking about how we can slow and slow erosion and reduce risk while maintaining water access and still preserving Nantucket's characteristic views of the water. Um, that's definitely something that we've heard about. Um, how do we maintain sort of the aesthetic and wonderful character of Nantucket? Um, we're envisioning these things could be uh, nature-based erosion management, like sand fencing, dune planting, and beach nourishment. Um, through a strategy like this, the town could maintain access for residents and uh, um, uh, uh, vehicles to downtown, but still pair that with protecting their quality of life. Um, there would still need to be, though, the ability for um, those homeowners who are located within this sort of purple zone to consider taking individual action, um, uh, uh, given that they would be exposed to flooding and to erosion. So there are also a series of dots here that are indicating adapted water access. This could mean um, uh, this area is enhanced. Uh, by potentially raising uh, infrastructure, again, related to this sort of purple line here, um, that would be a resilient transportation corridor. And then you can see that there would be um, the sort of second pairing of strategies that would be more structural in their uh, 
flood protection. So let me go to the next slide where we can maybe talk a little bit more in detail about this. Well, actually, Chelsea, um, can you go back to- Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this one or this one? This one. Um, so uh -huh. Kate had a question um, about how the erosion lines don't continue into the harbor, and I can actually answer that. I've I've heard um, Vince answer that before, um, and it's basically we're taking that information from a FEMA study, and FEMA only talked about the exterior of Nantucket and did not actually address the erosion rate on the inside of the harbor because they did not have, it was not within the scope of their research, um, but we are one of the few places in the U.S. that actually were able to have them study erosion um, as a kind of case study before they launch it nationally. Um, so this was the data that they gave us. We did not ask for it. We just happened to be the ones that they decided to study. Um, and that's why it's kind of on that exterior um, portion of the harbor instead of being on the inside. Could I jump in a little bit? So I understand that the FEMA study was just erosion, but I know that um, the coastal resiliency planning is using the MC firm um, flood risk model data, which is projecting sea level rise of two and a half feet by 2050. So that deals with the question of flooding on these streets. I mean, your purple line and your yellow line um, stop at Easton Street and Hulbert Avenue and Hulbert Avenue is actually higher up than many. There's that huge wetland off of Easton Street, but the streets like Willard, Walsh, that entire mm -hmm. area, that interior of Brant Point is what is subject to, um, you know, I already have sunny day flooding on my street. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what, um, what kinds of measures, if any, and I, we've already elevated our house. We did it in, you know, 2009. So I'm wondering what other measures, other than just sort of ind individual self-defense, are being contemplated as part of this plan for, you know, the very large residential area. And I've, I've been there my entire life since 1953. So I've seen all the development that's happened there. Um, mm -hmm. And, but there's a ton of development. And um, so, but the question is flooding, groundwater flooding, not erosion when you're dealing with those areas. But the data that, um, that Arcadis has includes the, and I thought was relying on the, um, the coastal risk management mo flooding model. So I'm just wondering if you can address the Brant point and what you really are how projecting in terms of your proposals for that area. I'm also wondering if this is viewed as a, coast, as a barrier for the downtown or not. It used to be a wetland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you, Kate, for, for sharing that. Um, in this situation, uh, or in this uh, proposal, again, this is this is to understand, you know, where we might uh, begin a discussion about what is acceptable to you all, um, and knowing where those concerns are. Um, so, in this strategy, it is more of a, a hybrid strategy where um, these areas have been identified um, as uh, areas that might be. Uh, again, more structural in the green and then something that's more of a sort of resilience quarter. And we can take a look at what that, that might look like in section um, to, you know, establish boundaries that say this is where they're really truly, it, like there is access to the, the steamboat wharf and that is an absolute uh, uh, point of, of infrastructure that the, the community uh, considers must be protected. Um, but, but again, thinking about how access to uh, the larger area um, might be connected into something like this. So um, uh, this is, this is a, a, the beginning of a conversation, I will say, um, to understand, like, is this uh, a way that, that 
uh, is acceptable to you all to begin thinking about um, uh, sort of giving uh, a line of defense to downtown. And then also to begin thinking about where, where that might uh, sort of begin and end and what that means for access and uh, transportation. Um, which we can see a little, a little bit more of in, in detail here. Um, uh, so uh, Kate, maybe to your point about like, is this a, a barrier for downtown? Uh, I think one of the strategies that we've been considering is does it sort of make sense to protect a sort of first line of defense, which you can see here in this dashed green line, sort of the, the edge of the harbor, um, or is there sort of a, a point that might offer a series of trade-offs um, when something might be proposed, like elevating the road. Um, so we can begin to see that there would be, um, again, a series of, of, of different uh, uh, things to consider um, in relation to the existing structures all throughout this area um, for, for access uh, to the existing buildings, um, to the sort of uh, change of the, the streetscape um, the, the potential uh, um, uh, change to the character of downtown. Um, so, so this is a, a way to sort of perhaps provoke conversation and um, to understand what this might mean for, for protection and defense, but also for um, what it is to continue living in this area. So it looks like we have a hand raised from C. Sutton, if you'd like to unmute. I did, thank you. Um, so Campbell Sutton here. I just, I wanted to respond to some of uh, what you've been talking about in the Brant Point area. Um, mm -hmm. I have a lot of experience in that area, uh, just from work and traveling, et cetera. I, I would view, uh, a seawall along the Easton Street properties as a viable option. Um, mm -hmm. I know a number of them have put up like plexiglass to try and stop the, uh, it's really the splash over that, that occurs along Easton Street. However, the, the ramp point area, as far as I'm concerned, is a sponge for the island. That's, that's, built on hydrostatic pressure. So water is bubbling up. So I'm not sure that actually ra raising the level of Hulbert Ave really does anything because the water bubbles up from underneath. In other words, as the waters rise in the harbor, the Brant Point from underground, the, the waters rise, which is why a good, I would say a good majority of the homeowners there um, have uh, sump pumps to pump water mm -hmm. out. There are some properties that have sump pumps going all the time. Um, and, and that's true down near Beaver Street and along Monomoy. So these are really mm -hmm. spongy areas that are so important for seawater rise. And what I'm finding and what I have a big issue with is the number of full basements that are going in, the amount of displacement that occurs when a hard structure goes in in the Brant Point area, that water is still coming in, but it has nowhere to go but up. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you just have a um, crawl space under your house, you are wet all the time. There are some properties that, um, you know, it, it's 16 inches down and you're into water. And I've noticed that some houses are really doing the rise for the flood plane insurance thing, but, mm -hmm. but still they're putting um, hard structures underground, which is displacing water. And I just see that as such a huge issue that's overlooked very often in these discussions as if Brant Point were like land where I, I don't really see it that way a lot, you know, so I, I don't want to carry on about it, but I think we should really uh, somehow we should encourage less development 
in these sponge areas around the island, whether it's in quays or whether it's in mm -hmm. um, Quidnet or, or whether it's Abrams Point or Brant Point, these are so vital to keeping the harbor waters at a reasonable level. And the more development that goes in, the higher the water gets regardless of sea level, right? So um, mm -hmm. anyway, thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you very much for your comments. This is exactly the information that we, you know, want to understand is um, of importance to everybody and um, is, is valuable for us to move forward with. So thank you. Thank you again for sharing. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a number of individual building scale adaptations that could take place. So some of the things that you mentioned already, elevating, flood proofing, wet flood proofing, wet, wet flood proofing. <laughs> um, relocation of essential uh, mechanical or um, critical systems. Uh, an individual could choose to do things like use deployable flood walls at entrances or building openings. This idea of um, you know tying into different regulatory mechanisms, purchasing flood insurance, et cetera. Um, reducing uh, impermeable paving is another sort of larger issue that could be taken on. Pumps, ways to discharge water. Um, and then, of course, you know, understanding the potential for relocation of a building um, on its property or elsewhere, um, you know, sort of space permitting is, is obviously a way to think about that as well. Um, so thank you for, for raising that point. And just a little plug, um, simultaneously happening was also the Resilient Nantucket design um, for adaptation grant, um, which just finished um, a document and a toolkit that talks about resilience and those approaches such as elevating and more of what a homeowner can do on an individual level. And that document is available through the town. We just had our final draft um, released. Mm -hmm. So that is also available um, through the Historic District Commission's website because it was a design guidelines document. Um, but provides guidance and links and information that you may use for a more individual basis. And I believe Lee has his hand raised. Great, thank you. Yes, thank you. I was waving both hands. Um, <laughs> as a preface to what I'm about to say, the obvious first steps should be natural and unobtrusive. Whatever we can do to retain the character of our core our residential old historic and, and the downtown would be great. But at some point, we're gonna to have to accept the fact that the water will rise. And then we may need to look elsewhere. If you visited London and stood on the embankment, for example, in front of the Tate Gallery and rested your elbows on that substantial parapet, that is in fact a tidal barrier. The embankment was built to contain the Thames and it was raised intentionally. Uh, in addition, Nantucket does have uh, stormwater collecting systems. They may have to be uh, expanded and uh, equipped with substantial pumps. If water does go over whatever it is we provide in terms of a seawall or bulkhead, um, to get it out from downtown quickly. And again, mm -hmm. there are plenty of examples, Holland, England, uh, where these things have been installed and we should look at the best of them so that whatever we choose is at least cost and least intrusion. Hey, thanks for your time. Yes, thank, thank you again, Lee. Um, that's a fantastic point. Um, and I also want to direct everybody to, to the, the chat here. We have a couple of different links um, that are uh, building on this idea of, of toolkits and strategies that can be adapted, but um, uh, take your point about um, looking elsewhere to understand what strategies are being used. Thank you for that, that point. Absolutely. Um, and Chelsea, which is, a, this next question is actually a really good segue to other, to a later slide. Um, okay. But it, Grant is asking, has anyone looked at the cost to protect Steamboat Wharf versus moving it to a new wharf at either Petrel's Landing or Francis Street? Has it been talked about? It has the added benefit of keeping large trucks out of downtown. 
Mm -hmm. So talking about that yeah. transportation corridor. <laughs> exactly. No, that, that is a really great segue. So um, again, the sort of primary driving factor here is to understand how we might keep access to all these different pieces of critical infrastructure. Also think about protection and sort of different levels of protection. So I am going to jump ahead again to this slide and we do have a, a blown up sort of image of uh, these, these smaller ones that you see here to the right. Um, but just to maybe, you know, again, start a discussion about what some of the, the approaches might be in downtown, where that takes place and what that might mean for the experience of downtown and sort of, you know, everything from the arrival in Nantucket to um, enjoying all the different historic assets to, you know, getting your food from the grocery store. Um, you can see here, we have three points selected. Um, so South uh, Beach Street, um, a, a point on, on Easy Street as well, um, that are, are showing potential ways to think about how um, this idea of structurally reinforcing a, a resilient transportation network might be a way um, uh, or might have many effects on downtown. So just to maybe give us all a little bit of context, you can see here in this uh, key, the height of barriers, this would be showing based on the existing grade um, in downtown currently, there uh, may be a need to raise elevation. Um, in this instance, we're again thinking about it as a roadway that would be elevated to bring the area um, outside of the 2070 mean monthly high water. Um, which in this scenario is at 7.2 feet, I believe. Um, so you can see that these are color coded to demonstrate where there are low points and there would need to be a higher barrier. And then likewise, where there are naturally higher points, the barrier would need to be lower. And I'm gonna flip here just quickly so we can continue to understand what this might mean and just see it more clearly. But thinking about how some kind of protection um, you know, again, to this, this question of, of trade-offs or what this might sort of start to, to mean for a, a spatial experience, um, understanding that uh, this, this first dash blue line would be that 2070 um, uh, uh, mean monthly high water, but that the second blue line is indicative of a 1% storm event. So it is much higher. You can see here it is 14.1 feet, so an additional seven feet. Um, in this situation, we're proposing raising it just above that first line, that mean monthly high, and then beginning to think about what it might mean to adapt a strategy like this to incorporate again some different sort of co-beneficial strategies for the town. So how might this be a space of public enjoyment, a space where we um, think about, you know, bringing different aspects of um, the ecosystem um, into the design but how might it still be something that is adaptable to the um, flood protection? So you can see none of these are, are proposed designs, but these all have different sort of um, character to them to suggest that there might be different ways to think about um, implementing uh, walls or structural elements into something like this. So again, as a sort of beginning point of discussion, uh, thinking about what it might mean to raise something how high uh, it might be comfortable to do so, and then sort of where that falls within the existing uh, fabric and structure of downtown, either as this like dash screen line, some, some uh, sort of more uh, immediate line of defense, or if it's something that sort of mitigates the various means of access through downtown and understanding what that might um, mean for other areas uh, on, one side or the other of this sort of proposed uh, network. So maybe I'll, I'll pause here just for a moment as well. I think our time is, is soon coming to a close, but wanted to, to get some feedback about what type of um, strategy might be acceptable to you. And this, this question of what does raising something look like um, to a certain height um, mean to you? So while people are typing in their questions, we did have a question come in while you were talking. Um, Joanna wants to know how feasible is this? And in what time frame is this possible, referencing raising roads? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Joanna, so um, thank you again. Uh, we are proposing strategies here that we're um, thinking about in the near term, again, with the idea that there would be, I'm gonna flip here, um, longer term allocation pathways that we're thinking about, but that these would be implementable um, in short term, we're calling five, 10 years, but again, that there would be a, a very serious series of trade-offs that the community and town would need to sort of discuss and understand um, the trade-off of protection for um, residences and businesses uh, not being available to everybody uh, uh, or not, not being protected necessarily and um, uh, how, how businesses and private properties would need to adapt to that new elevation. And I just received a note that we're going to close soon. <laughs> Um, so maybe one more question. I apologize for we're running short on time. So uh, can I just ask a follow up to that? So what other yeah, coastal yeah. what <clears throat> are there other coastal communities that have used this type of uh, remedy? Um, I know that this is a strategy that is um, considered uh, in, in many different toolkits. Um, I would be happy to also pose that question to the larger group. I. I believe Trevor could speak to um, where exactly this has been implemented, but um, uh, I believe we're going to close soon, so I'd be happy to bring that up. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Making enough. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I think everybody's back. We still have 80 people, which is fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us uh, on a, uh, a, a summer Thursday night. So I really appreciate everybody's uh, long uh, attention, and I hope that there were uh, good conversations in, in, 